Hey everyone, this is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology, and today we are going to take a look at Mars's upcoming square to Saturn. Now, Mars is in the sign of Taurus, making a square to Saturn in the sign of Aquarius. We're going to take a look at this from the standpoint of three themes and three spiritual insights. Been kind of pairing this, doing this kind of pairing lately, where it's like, okay, here's some archetypal themes, and here's some lessons that I seem to hear over and over again from clients and you know that i observe in my own life over and over again when, when these planets get together so um not things i've mastered things that i've noticed <laughs> you know so anyway before we get into it don't forget to like and subscribe share your comments click on the notification bell for updates transcripts of my daily talks can always be found on my website which is nightlightastrology.com when you're there check out my readings and courses um we're going to be very shortly promoting two new classes so I will be promoting, starting to promote that next week. If you have any questions as you're on the website, don't forget to email us, info at nightlightastrology.com. Okay, well, <clears throat> there are two transits on the 7th that we are going to be looking at this week. Um, one is Mars square to Saturn, and the other is Venus's trine to Neptune. Now, they're happening over the weekend, um, but it's good to get out in front of these, especially since they're in that... Uh, application process and coming into the engagement within three degrees, you can really start to feel them. Uh, so let us, uh, let me just put this up so we can see it. Here is August 7th, Mars square Saturn. Let's take a look at the real time clock. Whoop, there we go. So you can see here is Mars in, I don't have the outer planets in right now, separating from Uranus. And you can see the square from Mars in Taurus to Saturn in Aquarius. Now, in ancient astrology, Saturn is in the superior position. It is to, it is, its ray is moving from its right hand side toward Mars. If you imagine Saturn looking into the center of the wheel, and then you look to see which direction the aspect is in, you'll notice that it's coming off from Saturn's right hand side, if that makes sense. So that right handed aspect was considered to be more dominant or yang-like, which means this is a Mars-Saturn square that features Saturn impressing itself upon Mars. And I think that's important and has definitely played a role in the way that I've shaped the three themes for the day. Just keep that in mind. Okay, so with that in mind, that's happening on Sunday, August 7th. Now you're gonna feel that probably a couple of days afterward. So it does kind of linger in the air for a little bit. Uh, you could take it through the middle of next week, in fact. Um, and you should already be feeling it um, early this week, because if we back this up just a little bit, you'll notice here we have the three degree range by Tuesday, August 2nd. So we're already in that engagement range, which means Mars and Saturn are applying and perfecting by the weekend. So, but all week you'll be feeling this one. You may have, may all have already noticed it, although, you know, the the start of this week is definitely a mars uranus thing so you might be feeling like the mars uranus energy is really dominant but watch because very soon it's mars saturn and the theme sort of switches all right so mars square saturn what are the three themes that we can think about with this archetypal combination and then three lessons that i think are fairly common for both my clients students myself and sometimes you learn the same lesson over and over again don't you well, anyway, here are the three themes. Let's start off. One would be principled or rational actions. So what I mean by this is the idea that I am acting, I am taking a strong or decisive, executive, strongly determined energy uh, action, right? That's very Mars-like because of, now remember Saturn asserting its dominance over Mars uh, in an air sign because of a larger principle. Saturn in Aquarius can be very moral or political or ideological. And it says, because of this greater principle, you need to act in a certain way. I'm giving you the rationale with which to do something. Now, the action can be strong, bold, controversial. It could be a little bit, um, might drum up some um, controversy or conflict because we're talking about Mars after all, but you would be acting because of a principle or because of um, some probably larger theory or idea. Now this could be, you know, completely um, pragmatic and not harmful to anyone. For example, uh, here's the, here are the plans or designs for something that I'd like to build, especially with Mars and Taurus and Earth sign 
that Mars Saturn dynamic with Mars and an Earth Sun loves to build things. Let's start in on a project or a process and we have a plan and this is what we're going to do. So that would certainly be possible. Um, you can also think of this in terms of um, there are times in life where if you're going to get into a conflict with someone, I mean, at the, I would think the upside of this would be at least you're doing it because of some overarching principle that you stand for, like a, a belief or a, you know, a political party that you're, you know, it's important to you or something. You could also see the same combination leading to some, someone acting violently because of a principle. So that's the kind of combination that's in the air. This would also be um, number two about restraining anger or the will. So let's just say that a principle comes in and checks Mars and says, don't act or behave that way. Don't assert yourself. Don't build that thing. Don't, you can't do something you want to do. You, you, there's some way in which you're trying to assert yourself Mars, but Saturn comes in and checks it and says, yeah, but there's a limit. There's a rule. There's a code. There's a, um, there's a principle here that is restraining your action. And that might be a good thing, or it could be a very frustrating thing. It just depends on the circumstance. On the other hand, uh, learning how to restrain the anger, will, uh, temper, rage, that's all uh, part and parcel of Saturn and Mars as well. Uh, whether it's studying you know, the martial arts, uh, it's very Saturn-Mars uh, kind of thing to do, or whether it is, uh, you know, when I was doing some jujitsu last summer, which I really enjoy, but unfortunately I'm like a straw man. I just got beat up. Um, uh, and I know there's some people who listen who do jujitsu and I, I, I wish I had started it at a younger age, honestly, cause I just got the crap kicked out of me, but had fun doing it. <laughs> I've never had so much fun getting beat up, but I was thinking, you know, martial arts, very Saturn Mars. In fact, it was a Saturn Mars transit that, uh, launched me into doing jujitsu last summer. So Saturn Mars can be about like arm bars and restraints and, uh, you know, trying to hold someone until the police arrive. Uh, like you see those videos where it's like this man knew martial arts. And when the guy was trying to rob the clerk at the gas store, he restrained him until, until the police arrived. So, um, yeah, stuff like that. You can also think of, um, this as, uh, like if you, you're taking like a, you're, you're a hunter and you're taking like a firearm safety class before you're allowed to go deer hunting. Uh, you know, something like that. I don't know if they do that or not, but I remember when I was a kid, there was a class that, um, a lot of my friends took cause I lived in a place where people did a lot of duck and deer hunting. And, um, uh, they would have to go and like, you know, maybe go with their dad or something. And they would like learn all of the safety rules for guns before going hunting. Um, so, Anything that has to do with like a martial discipline or a, a how to use a weapon or how to restrain yourself or restrain someone else. Or even like if you worked like, um, you know, I remember um, my mom worked at a place one time where they had to learn how to restrain people in a, like a psychiatric setting where people could sometimes get violent. And they were like, the staff had to learn like all of these things that they would do if that were ever to happen. It did never happen to my mom, but you know, I remember her, I remember her coming home and like showing me like what she was learning in this training she was doing. It's also about, look, Mars can represent states of high tension and emergency. So you think of Saturn Mars, you also think about staying rational or calm or cool under pressure, such as the training that, um, you know, a paramedic might receive or something like that. Um, it's also about focus or concentration under pressure and the ability to be productive under constraints or deadlines. That's a famous Mars Saturn type of combination. So restraining the anger or the will or sort of like uh, some kind of, you know, martial discipline that could be applied in a million different ways. It could be the training of someone who's, uh, you know, on the row team and they get up every morning and like row. <laughs> so... <laughs> Uh, okay. So number three, domineering behavior. Now this would be kind of the worst possible combination where it's like the, the, the principled controlling heavy handed Saturn along with the, uh, domineering bullying Mars. So you get like bullies or you get people who are trying to control you, or you get uh, conflict with authority rules or laws. Um, and 
usually with the sense for like, I want to be free and you're trying to constrain something or you're someone's trying to um, limit me and I will not be limited. So there could be a bit of a, a boxing match between Mars and Saturn too. Uh, and you could see that going the other way where it's like, like I said, like, you know, you have to learn how to control your anger at times in your life. I mean, that's just something that we learned since the time we're kids. All right. So those to me are some of the big obvious lesson or themes that you should see as Mars and Saturn get together between now and uh, the end of the week. Uh, through the weekend. But there's three lessons that I think come along with it. And these are just things that I've observed again through what students have said as I've you know, listened to thousands of people over the course of my career talk about all sorts of different kinds of aspects and transits and so forth, or my clients or things that I've observed when I've gone through these. Number one, rage will always say I am necessary. Now it's funny, I was just talking to some, I actually had someone, really wonderful person that I had the pleasure to read a chart for and also uh, wrote into Bhakti Wednesday with a question about rage and dealing with rage. And we were talking about it and a uh, super smart person really had uh, good things to say. And I, and I was kind of like, we, we were debating a little bit about certain aspects or dimensions of, um, of rage and anger. And I just kept thinking, these are going to be, these are some really good points for not only Mars Uranus, which is coming up as I'm meeting with this person and making the Bhakti Wednesday video, but um, also um, you know, uh, dealing with the energies myself and just noticing them in the air. So, uh, rage will always say I am necessary. And I think that there's a, there's some really interesting patterns wrapped up in this. For example, a lot of the time rage comes because something has been excluded. So for example, if we push some aspect of ourselves down and say you're bad or you're unimportant, or I don't have time for you, or you're not worthy, or you're not special, or you don't deserve joy or you're, there's something wrong or different about you in within ourselves. Or if society, society, <laughs> if, if people do that to other people, then there's a way that eventually that, that repressed or that pent up thing has to find a way out. And when it does, it often comes tearing out like a bullet. It has a velocity and a speed and a potential for damage behind it. And it is often described as rage. Let's take a look at that word etymologically. You guys know how I love my etymologies. I always like to do this because I, I always learn so much from it. <clears throat> yes, so um, it here's, isn't this interesting? Mid 13th century from Rajan, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, to play or romp. Uh, now, original sense, now obsolete, it says, meaning be furious, seek passionately or go mad, be violently driven or agitated. But isn't it interesting that it also has the root of to play or to romp? I think that that is super fascinating. And here's why. I was also doing an I Ching reading recently, and a commentator was talking about hexagram. I think it was 58, if I remember correctly, which is sometimes translated as empowering. And one of the, you know, this author was sort of, you know, waxing uh, philosophical about the hexagram in the I Ching. One of the things they were saying is that um, every part of the psyche seeks its own joy, like its fulfillment in expressing its own nature is joy. Like if, if, if I am myself and express myself freely and naturally, I should feel happy, right? That there's, that's like a, a philosophical assumption and in, in sort of like, um, well, in ancient Greek philosophy, the equivalent that this author was talking about was the daimon. The idea that there are aspects or dimensions of ourselves that, um, you know, seek expression and will find a way of expressing themselves, even if we try to keep them down. And I think that in a way, part of what is going on with rage and, and anger and trying to control it is that we don't, it's like, it's not just like, oh, well, I have pent up rage. It's usually that there are aspects of myself much more diverse and interesting than rage that are seeking expression. And because they can't or haven't, when they show up, there is, there's rage is almost like the, the first thing you see. And this was what the author was expressing saying, um, you know, if we haven't 
given meaningful expression to all parts of our psyche, then we don't have joy. And often what we have is rage. And, and, and then it'll come out. When it does come out, it will, you know what it says? Interesting. So many people who have rage, including myself, when I have, we defend it. We say, no, it's necessary. It's real. Don't tell me it's not. Don't hand me a bunch of petty garbage about pacifism, you know, because there's something in us that understands that the rage is part of some aspect of our soul or psyche that, you know, is seeking expression. And behind that seeking of expression is actually like joy, not cheap rainbow unicorn joy, but the joy of reality, the joy of soul. And so I think that one of the things that happens is that when rage comes up, you know, people will say, oh gosh, you've got a rage problem. And I, and I, I almost always think it's more complicated than that. And that's why you sometimes hear people say rage is necessary. It's like, there's a reason for it being here. It's just, it has a purpose. Don't tell me to tamp it down. There's a lot of anger at people telling you not to be angry. <laughs> and I don't, And but the tricky thing is, is I really, most of the time, I think that if we take the time to get to know ourselves through deliberate spiritual practice, we come to find out that all, there's, Rage is almost like a byproduct of not allowing for some part of ourselves to be itself. And so I, th I not always, but I think that that's a big, a big reason why. And then we end up defending rage when we really should be figuring out what it is that we're angry about or who it is that's not getting expressed. And then we can move past starting to develop like a pathology of rage. You know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, rage is my personality because it's authentic. Don't tell me it's not. Y you know what I'm saying? So anyway, rage will always say it's necessary. And I think there's some pretty deep reasons for why rage is always saying I'm necessary. I'm necessary. Don't exclude me. So it's just something to think about, something that I often think about with myself and my own like inner process with rage whenever it does come up. Um, number two. This is part of the conversation I had with this person as well. And I had it, had it many times in our yoga studio. We would have yoga teacher trainers in. We'd be talking yoga philosophy. And this came up like a lot. So I have heard this so many times. And it was just reiterated in the conversation with my client who also wrote into this Bhakti Wednesday program about rage. And um, that's, this, that's this week, by the way, that video on Bhakti Wednesday about rage. Anyway... They said, you know, they were being really authentic and I thought, and I think really smart. So even though I disagree with this perspective, I think it's really intelligent. Um, so this person said, I just feel like when people tell me to develop a more peaceful attitude that, you know, peacefulness and pacifism and mindfulness and all these things are sort of like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a privilege, you know, it's like you, you get to be that way or do that thing because you're privileged. Well, that's interesting. Um, I think that that sometimes is true. It's true when you see people who are, you know, like, let's say they're not really practicing the art of peace, which um, in my humble opinion is very hard. <laughs> like it's not easy to, I mean, it can be, but it's not easy to practice pacifism. Pacifism does not mean that you don't have teeth. It doesn't mean that you don't have criticism. It doesn't mean you don't have judgment. It doesn't mean you don't have discernment. It doesn't mean that you dismiss the difference between good or bad or become some kind of neutral automaton. Uh, it doesn't mean any of those things. Pacifism as a practice is, to me, it's like, um, it's like learning how to flow with things in a way that um, is nonviolent, essentially. It's like it, there's a way through, as the Tao teaches, there is a way through and the Tao flows and moves through everything with flexibility and, and intelligence. And compassion is sort of part of that and peacefulness is part of that, but it's not some like kumbaya. Pacifism is not the same as kumbaya. Uh, it is very much described in uh, Eastern philosophies in relation to martial arts, for example, peacefulness as a way of life is very attentive and very smart. And it and it's not easy to stay in a consciousness of, of peacefulness, which is why it needs to be cultivated. 
um, it's much easier to just be spinning around in reactivity all the time. And in that, those cycles of reactivity, um, it's really hard. It's just difficult to be in that space, which naturally makes us quite defensive when we react. We say, well, how could you blame me? You know, I'm just, I'm doing my best, but how could you blame me? Um, and, you know, there's behind that, like, how could you blame me? Is there's often a sense of being responsible for everything. And peacefulness is also about moving beyond being responsible for things and moving through things with acceptance. It's like moving from responsibility, like responsible moral complex. And while we recognize that, that there's a dimension of experience that involves responsibility and morality, it's about moving through life, moving through experience with a kind of very, you know, intelligent, present form of acceptance and making choices rooted in the unique context of every moment with an eye for um, harmony, with an eye for unity. And to me, I, there's, first of all, it's interesting that almost every tradition that has pacifism or peacefulness or mindfulness or something like that as a practice is not coming from people of privilege. It's coming from people of that, that generally practice austerity and renunciation, which means that in order to get better at the practice, it helps if you have less things and if you have less like material desires. So I don't really see people like that, that I've, you know, like the the Pujaris sitting in a loincloth in India that I've, you know, seen and talked to, um, you know, the, 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 the lifestyle that they cultivate in order to embody yoga, for example, uh, or if you, there's a great documentary called Amongst White Clouds. It's about Taoist hermits living in the mountains. Look at the life that they cultivate. Look at the the devotion and care that they give to their practice and look at how humble they are at the roots. The masters of these great traditions are not privileged people. They're not like movers and shakers in society, you know, society. <laughs> Every time I say it, it's like, I have to, it's like a sound effect button I have to press anyway. So that's my rebuttal is that I don't, I now is it possible that pacifism is kind of like a privileged hoity toity lifestyle? Yeah, of course it is. And that's what's so obnoxious about it. But to think that's all that it is, that's just, you know, to me, that's just kind of unimaginative. Or it just doesn't, it's not seeing the world very, with which with much like um, nuance or depth. I, you know, of course, pacifism can be espoused, you know, like, oh, like, you know, look at my, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, you know, celebrities who are on the cover of Vogue who are like, I practice yoga and I'm peaceful or something. And it kind of annoys you, you know, I'm not trying to be cynical, but, you know, I get where that comes from. The, but the other thing I would say, the reason that I, for me, the practice of pacifism isn't a privilege is because it's freaking hard. Like I, for, for me personally, learning how to work with anger, judgment, critical voices toward me or others. Um, and, and, and learning to ad adopt um, a yogic form of consciousness or uh, try to cultivate it has been, it's required nothing less than my heart, soul, and a good portion of every day of my life. So, um, and from that position, often what comes back to me is not a sense of um, my own privilege, but a sense of my own spiritual bankruptcy. Like I don't have many good qualities. That's what I feel through my spiritual practice. What, what I mean, you know, like brag worthy qual. I don't, I feel what my practice puts me in touch with is, you know, stay close to your hypocrisy, stay close to the fact that, you know, you're not better than anyone else. And it's that, that doesn't, it's like, because of that, I can't get up on some moral high ground and it becomes a lot harder to get into states of like conflict and rage with other people. Cause I'm like, I can't convince myself that I'm that, that I'm that elevated. Do you, do you know what I mean? But I'm not talking about, you know, I'm talking about my everyday life. I'm not saying that there aren't principles that I wouldn't fight for or sacrifice for, um, morally or spiritually. Um, of course, but Anyway, I hope I'm making some sense. Number three, discipline isn't the same as devotion. Mars Saturn will often tell you, uh, like, for me, I'm, I'm, you know, like one of the things that uh, 
there's a lot of controversy around um, Jordan Peterson. I'm sure you guys are familiar with who he is and you, you either love him or you hate him and whatever. Um, I have listened to some of his talks, not many. Um, and uh, I, they've not really resonated with me for a variety of reasons. I, I really enjoyed, he had a talk that I listened to where he talked about fairy tales and Disney movies. And he had like a Jungian excavation of those movies and fairy tales. And that I found very meaningful. Like speaking as a Jungian, I liked what he had to say. Political stuff, I don't, you know, it's just not, I don't get into that stuff for what anyone, I'm not into political stuff across the board. So that's just, it's just not, doesn't entertain me. Um, but one of the things I did one time was I just, I was like, okay, he has a new book. I saw a lot of people talking about on social media. It was like 12 rules for life or something. And I saw a lot of rules that's, you know, felt like my Capricorn moon was like, go, I think one of them was like, get up in the morning and like make your bed or something like that. And I was like, oh, okay, you know, okay. This is like one of those self-helpy develop discipline. No one can do this, but you pull up your, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Okay. Like, you know, it's like this shtick is archetypal and it is, you know, as old as time, <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, and I wasn't very impressed by it because I'm what really moves me are people who say things, um, you know, that are really different from anything I've ever heard or that make me think about something in a new way. And this, this, for whatever reason, this just wasn't doing it for me. And if other people out there like really like it, that's cool. But the, my, my one beef with it, my one beef was really simple was that, um, I kept thinking to myself as I read like a little bit of the Kindle sample or whatever it was that I was reading, I thought, you know, this is so much about discipline and like principles. And the truth is that um, we can try to hammer the heart into submission through discipline. And there's a lot of things you can get in life or master or accomplish through discipline. You can feel stronger, you can feel more confident, you can win a gold medal through discipline. But one of the reasons I love bhakti is because bhakti replaces the word discipline with devotion. And it says, look at the end of the day, Anything, any discipline you're doing without heartfelt, loving care and tenderness, if it doesn't make you kinder, if it doesn't make you stronger, but also gentler, um, if it doesn't uh, help you to be more empathetic while also more confident, you know, because that's what devotion does. And it's different than discipline. And when I was reading the book, I couldn't get into it because I'm just... I feel like this world needs more than discipline. It needs devotion. And there's a big difference in how we can change our lives through the energy or mood of devotion compared to just, you know, rules for life that may be very good or helpful in some for some people or, you know, or whatever. But, you know, it's like the heart is who we are. It's like we're all like little beautiful pink hearts. And um, if we want to grow anything, you know, it all comes through that heart. And if you care for the heart in the same shape that the heart is made in, good things grow, good things grow that last. And you become the kind of person that, you know, in, engenders love and devotion to other people and from other people to you. So to me, I would be very careful. I, I think, I don't know off the top of my head. Actually, it makes me want to look, I bet. Let's just look at his birth chart. I feel like and I'm, not, I'm not trying to pick on on him at all because I, um, I I don't know him and I honestly have not watched almost. Yep. Okay. Look, could you, you can't make this shit up. I did not know. I swear to God, I did not know this. He has Mars in Taurus exactly square to Saturn in Aquarius. That shit is, that's crazy. I had no idea. I promise you, I hadn't even looked. I didn't, I wasn't even planning on mentioning it. In fact, I, I was, as soon as I said it, I was like, oh God, I mentioned Jordan Peterson's name. I'm, I'm screwed. Like, why did I even say that name? <laughs> because it's so, it's so loaded. But that's a perfect example of astrology. Anyway, I was like, I get a major Mars Saturn from the vibe of this book. And while, again, like I'm, I have the moon in Capricorn. So there's definitely been phases of my life where I feel like the rules for life thing is has it has a lot of appeal. Like discipline has had a lot of appeal to me. But bhakti came into my life and it was like, you know what? Replace the word discipline with devotion and you're set. And I was like, yes, yes. And it came in my life. It came in when I was becoming a dad. 
And I realized like my, like I, I was like such a disciplined reader and writer and like I have my daily practices and I was just like, not soft, not soft enough. You know, um, I, I can tell you right now that, that, uh, I was just, I, I was thinking about Mars Saturn and I was, as I was making this talk and I was like, those rules for life that in that little excerpt that I read, that was very Mars Saturn. I didn't even know that he had Mars Saturn. I literally just looked that up right now in the same signs. Wow. That's powerful. Anyway, I hope that you get the point without really, it's really not about, to me, it's really not about Jordan Peterson. Um, it, you know, but I like, I'm like, for me, the, the, I just, I feel like right now in the world, when I look around across the entire political spectrum, there is a lot of Mars Saturn. There's like, I am, I'm, I stand by my principles. That is so admirable. Like, honestly, like there are worse things in the world than people being like true to their principles. I, I think most of the time that makes for admirable human beings. But I feel like that Mars Saturn could use a flip of the word devotion, uh, discipline and replace it with devotion. Anyway, those are just my thoughts. I hope that you guys found this interesting. Uh, please don't slaughter me in the comments section. I'm human and I do bleed. Anyway, um, please like and subscribe, share your comments, click the notification bell for updates. You'll find transcripts of my daily talks on my website, nightlightastrology.com. Uh, new classes will be up next week. I hope that some of you will be able to um, join for those new classes. We'll be advertising those next week. One on planets, planet and plant new and full moon circles in 2023 that Ashley and I will be leading. And then a new masterclass series that will be taking place quarterly. Uh, if you're looking at uh, anything on my websites, readings or courses, and you have questions, email info at nightlightastrology.com. That's what I've got for today. We'll see you again tomorrow. Bye.